Well, my wife and I had four children, and uh, they all went into different things. They even listened to different kinds of music. And there's 10 years between the youngest and the oldest. Uh, we never encouraged it. People used to think we might be like tennis parents, pushing <laughs> a, our youngest child into the same yeah. thing. Uh, but, you know, we, we sort of uh, almost discouraged it in a way, but it was just, you know, that way. David started when he was, I don't know, eight or nine, being interested in the subject because mm -hmm. we were sitting in the middle of the forest down there in a thatched house with, you know, no electricity, and we had to boil our water to drink it. Had to wait a couple of days for it to cool. And, uh, you know, it was just a, a different way of life, and it was boring in some ways. And I guess you'd go out yeah. and, you yeah. know, look at stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, it, I remember being an eight-year-old kid and, you know, living in this Maya village and at first not liking it very much. You know, I, I came from, you know, this uh, American lifestyle and was plopped down in this, you know, rainforest <laughs> hut, you know, uh, and it was a huge adjustment. I ended up loving it. And so it, it was that experience which really, you know, I, I keep with me still. It's, it's, this is fun stuff that, you know, the, the work that we're doing. And I picked up on that uh, at that time because I saw my dad having fun doing it. And, and it, I never thought of this and still don't think of it as work. You know, it's, it's a hobby that has turned out to be, um, you know, one that I can, you know, get a job at, but it's it's still the fun of it that keeps it going. And so we're still working together and, you know, writing together and doing all sorts of stuff. I first went to Palenque when I was a kid, of course. I think I was on the same trip. That you were three, yeah. three years old. And, um, and I do remember being there at that time because uh, I remember the, you know, the dump trucks and the the dirt, you know, coming off of the palace and, and uh, the excavations going on. Um, and it, it, I have to say that today still, just walking around that site, um, it, it's a magical experience. There's really no other place like it because when you walk, say, through the palace, Pakal's palace, it's still there. I mean, it's, it's, it's not even really a ruin. Yeah, there's some walls that are down and, you know, um, but you, you, the plaster's on the walls. You're, you're walking through these galleries, through doorways, you know, turning corners and you see a bench there and a, you know, a platform over there and the paintings are still on the walls in many places. You, you get a sense of, of a, a lived space, you know, of, of people. And uh, there's really no other Maya site like that that has you know, such an atmosphere. In, in addition to that, it's in, you know, the jungle is right around you. The, you hear the howler monkeys in the mornings and the evenings and uh, the mist from the, the forest coming off. Um, it's just an incredible place to be. And uh, uh, it'll always have that aura about it, I hope. I remember well going, uh, being the, I think I was the second person in, but it felt like I was the first person into a, one of the royal tombs at the site of Rio Azul, Guatemala, back in 1984. And uh, we had lifted one capstone off and we could see that nothing had been disturbed. There was no dust or dirt over everything. And it was just like it had been left except everything that was, you know, not, not preserved was not preserved, but the pottery and the, the, Part of the skeleton and everything were there and it was it was kind of creepy and wonderful and strange and it changed a lot of things i had thought about you know it was uh it was wonderful and yet it was arresting in terms of having thought about you know the this person lying here you know it was just like me and what the heck am i doing here you know <laughs> and i felt like getting out right away and just leaving the person alone i think for me uh one of the most amazing experiences I've had is um, visiting a uh, remote archaeological site in Guatemala uh, called San Bartolo. And my friend uh, and student at that time, Bill Saturno, had just discovered inside of a looter's trench in a, in a pyramid some uh, exposed wall paintings. And through um, the help of National Geographic, in fact, we went back 
about a month later to uh, really study it. He was just there for just, you know, a few moments really. And so we went and explored the site and we didn't know anything about it. We didn't know the layout, the size of it, anything like that. And the paintings, just a small portion of them were exposed, turned out to be the earliest uh, and best preserved Maya wall paintings uh, ever found. And uh, they're still being excavated right now. So it, it's turned out to be one of the great discoveries ever. I think the most important question in the world today, as it's always been, is to realize that other people live differently and it's all right. Uh, and that across the gulf of culture and across the gulf of time presents a whole new set of problems for understanding another people. And what we'll never know everything. And we hardly know anything really about the Maya. You know, there's, there's almost 6,000 archeological sites and we've dug at 40 of them. Um, you know, we're, we're just at the beginning. Uh, archaeology in, in this part of the world has really only been going on for a little over a hundred years, and that's nothing. I mean, that's just a few generations of science and, and archaeology, and, you know, there is just more and more out there. We know it's there. The discoveries are just waiting to be done. So it, it's the best time right now to be, to, I think, to be studying this field and, you know, bringing in all sorts of knowledge to the question of, of, you know, who were the Maya and other people in Mesoamerica and how did they live? Um, you know, you bring science, you bring philosophy, you bring uh, linguistics, you bring all sorts of stuff. And uh, that's the joy of it. It's just not being so narrow, but to, to rake in all of this different kind of information. And I remember when uh, about 30 years ago, David asked me the question, <laughs> is it too late to get into Maya archeology? span And I said, no. It could teach us a little bit about living in, a, in an environment that might be slightly marginal. It could teach us a lot about basic things like how to grow enough food to feed a population and how to operate without depending too much on uh, things that we have to get from elsewhere, like oil, and uh, just all sorts of things. I think we can learn to be a little uh, more uh, cooperative with the earth around us and all mm -hmm. that live in it. Yeah, and it's, the Maya were not always successful at that. And, and that's the thing that I think we should really study closely, is that, you know, they, they hadn't figured out that balance. They uh, tripped up in many areas of that engagement with their environment. And I think for that reason, in some cases, they, they failed. I mean, they failed as communities, and they failed um, to kind of reach a uh, a balanced existence like that. If we study where things worked for them, where things didn't work for them, um, I think that's where we can really benefit. Um, because one of the fastest growing areas of the world right now is, is you know, are in these countries in the kind of tropical uh, lowlands, you know, of Guatemala or Mexico. You know, the populations are booming there. and. It's in the next few decades where everything is going to change drastically, even more than it has already. And yeah, I think looking at the past to the deep past is really beneficial for seeing how we can plan for, for the future.